Released in 1989, this dark comedy directed by Joe Dante and starring Tom Hanks, Carrie Fisher, and Bruce Dern about suburbanites who think their neighbors are part of a satanic cult did not hit well with the critics. Sitting at 53% on the tomato meter with a 70% audience score, this film has definitely divided audiences and critics. Today on You've Never Seen It, we're talking about The Burbs. Welcome to You've Never Seen It, an audio podcast where I am on a mission to never hear these four words again. I'm your host, Allison Salamone, and joining me today are two people who truly adore this movie. One of them has even gone as far as to defend why it might be the greatest movie of all time. Returning this week, we have good friend Moose Haas, and then for his first time on You've Never Seen It and talking the burbs, we got Brother Lomas. What's going on, guys? Hello, my fellow Americans. <laughs> hello, hello. <laughs> How I are am, you both doing today? <laughs> I'm great. This is a great day. I get to talk the burbs with Brother Lomas. I don't I don't know if I know anyone outside of my family that shares the love of this movie quite like my dear friend Brother Lomas. It is it is a very impactful and informing film. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> Those are some words to describe it for sure. <laughs> so, so before we even kind of get into um, this film itself, uh, Brother Lomas, can you kind of give me a little background in your history, just with movies in general and, and what got you into to watching films and, and what do you enjoy about them so much? Um, essentially, what got me into movies was social awkwardness. <laughs> Um, like, so like as, as a youth, I despised other human beings <laughs> and enough. I found that if I went to the movie theater, they turned out all the lights and it became like a, a social convention that they couldn't talk to me <laughs> while I was there. <laughs> and so it became a way that I could, I could still connect to humanity without having to interact with humanity. And that was really what I was going for in my youth. And uh, so that's that's why I got into movies. It's mostly because I hate humans. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. And then what what is it about the burbs that you love so much? The burbs, like, I, as a person, I believe that the greatest jokes that you can tell are like jokes that people don't know are being told. Like, um, I'm pretty sure that like the entire, you know, the 1970s were just like one long prank and no one was ever told about the punchline. <laughs> and to me, that's what the burbs feels like. I feel like when you're watching the movie, there's all this, there's the obvious jokes that are like world class that are right on the front. But then there's like all these subtle jokes going on in the background that you don't really notice until like your 19th viewing of the film. Like not a lot of people pick up that like when Rick Dukeman is like sitting there at the breakfast table, grabbing all the food. At one point he eats dog food. Not a lot of people <laughs> even pick that up. Right. And that's what. And, that one. <laughs> yeah. And, and the burbs, you know, it, it doesn't hammer you home like these modern comedies with their nonsense. It just leaves the jokes back there and you have to go and you have to find the joke. And that's what I love about the movie. You have to put effort to get it. Yeah. You, there's a lot of effort put into getting some of these jokes. What about you, Moose? Cause you were, you were also ecstatic when you saw this on my list and had to, had to jump on to talk about it. So my, there's like several like love affairs that my family have with certain actors and actresses. And, and one of them is 
Tom Hanks, especially like 80s, early 90s, goofy Tom Hanks roles. Um, and they they absolutely appeal to our family. And like Tom Hanks' physical comedy ability in the 80s movies were un paralleled and like unmatched to anybody acting today uh like he could just example like when tom hanks walks down the stairs after the clopex house explodes <laughs> and he like so slips freaking, real quick <laughs> yes it's so funny how he does that and it's just a little subtle thing and like and like loma said i've seen this movie so many times that like all these little subtleties makes so like for such fun like rewatches and reviews of this movie the the rick Ducommon just eating breakfast scene in itself like rick Ducommon in that scene is amazing yeah he just keeps eating and then he grabs ray's food and then he goes to the fridge and gets more food and then yeah carrie fisher's walking by with the dog bowl and grabs a handful <laughs> of dog food and stuffs it in but he doesn't like his it's just his facial reaction to it then he just drinks coffee and he continues eating yeah <laughs> And then afterwards, he, as they walk outside after Rick Bucom and Art Wayne Gardner eats all of this food, he walks outside and asks Gray, he's like, hey, you want to go to the deli and get one of those roast beef uh, sandwiches? <laughs> <laughs> so, to Lomas's point, my family has watched this movie so many times. Like, we appreciate and keep coming back to those funny moments. And, oh, my gosh, my... My father has like a list of maybe 10 movies that he's watched a hundred times and could probably recite from scratch. And the Burbs is one of them. So my dad will still like drop the Hans Christian Andersen or if somebody gets upset, he'll be like, oh, that's a 10 on the old uh, tension scale there, Rube. So <laughs> this movie has always been a, a Haas family favorite. Um, and for me, it's always been a favorite. Like I said, I love goofy young Tom Hanks. And uh, this is one of his, like, best comedic roles I think he's ever had. It was it, – fun is a word for it. I also, like, they definitely hit you over the head with the fact that, like, we're in suburban America. Like, this is what it is. Like, you have the neighbor who, like, in the opening scene lets his dog out and goes and takes a shit on the lawn – of of Bruce Dern and like he and and you have a Corey Feldman over there and as he's about to like step and he's like watch out she was <laughs> it's just like uh Bruce Dern in this movie I first of all was like holy shit that's Bruce Dern because I'm so used to seeing him old like super old in things so I'm like oh that's what Bruce Dern looked like when he was not as old <laughs> Bruce Dern has been old since 1972 right yes <laughs> The last thing I watched Bruce Dern in before this was the Peanut Butter Falcon, and where he's, oh, yeah, he's really old. He's super old. The Peanut Butter Falcon, yeah. Um, but this, I, I mean, I was, I, had, I had messaged you guys too, like as I was watching it, and I still, like, I'm still not sure how I feel about it in either way because this movie itself did not do well with crit. It was 53 percent on Rotten Tomatoes. So it was it's it's not one that I think was ha has been very well received but seems like one that as time's gone on has become more of a cult phenomenon maybe it it goes to the point like I don't even think that you realize what the jokes and the burbs are until like the 10th time you've watched it <laughs> yeah. like I don't know if I want to put No that no it, it's worth it something is and it's like the all of the jokes like that you see the first time you watch the burbs, those are jokes designed to distract you from the real jokes. It, it's it's like a game that they're playing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I do enjoy Tom Hanks going from like zero to a hundred real fast with art. Like four or five different times in the movie like he's calm and he's fine and then like just loses it on art like tom hanks losing his shit is probably one of my favorite versions of tom hanks oh for sure it it's like it's almost a world-class act like acting job at the end of the movie when he when hanks finally just loses it on art and just goes on that little tirade and he's like and we're throwing garbage in the street like 
it's world class <laughs> acting just in that little like three minute like rant that he goes on. It's perfect. And then at the end when he just shoves the uh, like the uh, stretcher into the uh, uh, ambulance, and he's like, yeah, yeah he's and then like, dives on going, it. My eye hurts. I'm going to the hospital. <laughs> and then Carrie Fisher comes up and she's like. I'll just uh, I'll just find out what hospital you're going to. Like, okay, honey, love you. <laughs> I'll meet you there. <laughs> it's so brilliant. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with Lomas. The yeah, there is a lot of like subtle like jokes and jabs at like suburban life, but then some of the jokes, like the garbage in the street, is just always there. Like that <laughs> happens so early yeah. on in the movie, and then the garbage is just constantly there. And it's there throughout the entirety of the movie. And like just that little like just leaving a pile of garbage in the middle of the street for the entirety of the film is so brilliant. Oh, I love it. This movie's so freaking great. Like for an example, like you you never notice it's like when they're standing in front of the garage and he's like trying to show him his tools, and he's like, You got tools, huh? You gonna build something with those tools? Yeah. Like, he doesn't even look at him and he goes, oh, those are beautiful. <laughs> you see? That's like a, the reason that's such the perfect joke is like 13% of your life in suburbia is just pretending to have conversations that you don't really want to have. Yep. And, and that is why that is such, a, that is why it's so brilliant. Yep. Yeah, I could see that. So if you had to, if someone had to ask you, or they asked you your top three moments in this movie, oh, what would they that be? Is a, that is a good question. Can I ponder this for like a minute? Okay. okay. I'll, I'll for go. sure. I'll go. For sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the opening kicks off so great. Uh, I think the like opening scene where Hanks comes down and he's standing on his lawn. And then as soon as he walks into the Klopex lawn, like the wind catches up, there's like leaves and everything, yeah. and then he steps backwards and the wind stops. And he looks over to his right, and there's old Rumsfeld just smoking his pipe, watching him, not getting involved. I, I love that opening scene. That's definitely in my top three favorite. Um, when Hanks is is trying to take a nap because he's got this like horrible like, or he had this horrible dream. Um, uh -huh. They wake him up, and then he hits like he stubs or. Uh, uh, Uncle Reuben throws the receipt over and he grabs the beer can and he crumbles them and he like just shatters the beer cans instantly. And then when Carrie Fisher hits him in the head like 10 seconds later, he grabs another set of beer cans and crushes them and throws them to the side. And she's like, did the beer can crushing help? He's like, yeah, it kind of did. Yeah. And then uh, Rumsfeld's slide tackle of Hans is cinematic yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> when he's like, hey, Pinocchio, As where a, are you going? Yeah. And then he fly tackles him and drops the light. I was 18 months in the bush. I'll snap your neck in a heartbeat. <laughs> it's so great. <laughs> Carrie Fisher, I loved this movie because you slowly get to watch her just like get so yeah. fed up with Tom Hanks' shit. Like, she's like, why are you, like, we're supposed to go on, you're, you're on vacation. Let's go do this. Like, why are we still sitting here? And just watching her just, like, slowly just get fed up. And then she just goes and gets a haircut and comes back. And, like, as Tom Hanks is walking out after being <laughs> blown up in the house, he's like, you did your hair. It looks nice. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's good. That was a good one right there. And she's just like, yeah, it's fine. What are you gonna do? Like I, it, like at that point, it, it seems like she's not even mad at him anymore. She's just yeah. like, "Look what you did! Like <laughs> here we go. Like, you proud of yourself? You learn. You learn. You live and you learn." <laughs> like uh, I would argue that this is Carrie Fisher's best role, other than Amazon Women on the Moon. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, like in the Star Wars movies, she's just like some angry vengeful teenager who wants to bang her brother but like but like in in the burbs man her character has depth you know they give her something to do and to me this is like peak carrie fisher like it it was all uphill until here and then after that it's just 
it's really downhill, like way downhill. <laughs> but there was this moment and Amazon Women on the Moon, man. Amazon Women on the Moon is not one that I am. Oh, let me I tell must... you something, man. <laughs> if you want like a high level comedy, Amazon Women on the Moon with Carrie Fisher, <laughs> you need to see this film. <laughs> I didn't even know that that was a film, and now I'm very, I'm very bonus content. We get start getting enough listeners, I'll start doing some bonus. Well, that'll be that'll be our, our bonus. bonus. What are your three favorite <laughs> moments of the Burbs? Um, the breakfast scene I love because I yeah. think there's like just a lot. There's like a lot of subtle comedy, like Carrie Fisher, Rick Dukeman, Tom Hanks. I think they all like give like these really awesome subtle comedic performances you know and i think one of the reasons that i really love older comedies is like it it's just so subtle you have to like actually think about the jokes instead of just you know like people running around naked and screaming you know the the joke is in there but you have to look for it and i think they all just in that scene just give like really subtle great comedic performances and then the scene with the garbage men, like where they jump in the garbage truck mm. and that, that in itself is <laughs> awesome. But there's like a side thing where like the one garbage man is like arguing over like, um, <laughs> it's like the right of winter garbage goes onto the trash, how it's public domain. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> And how we can't do anything because it's 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 there. So like you let them do <laughs> what they're doing with it. And I love when Bruce Dern hops in with him <laughs> and starts. So you help me with this? <laughs> yes. And ride in the truck. <laughs> and oh if I may go off on like a weird side tangent, I had like a very similar experience to this garbage truck thing once. So, like, I, w I was in Washington, okay. D.C., and this was – I so sorry, I'm going to go off on a tangent. Bear with me, right? And I was in this class, <laughs> and as part of the class, you had to be homeless for, like, three days, uh, you know, to learn what it was like to be homeless, you know? And so they just dropped us off in Washington, D.C., and then they'd come back, and they'd pick us up, like, three days later. But you would go out in, like, a team with one other person, and there was this guy – like driving around like the capital and like this giant like rv with like really graphic pictures of like aborted fetuses just on his rv just driving around just like screaming in like a you know a loudspeaker and the the guy that i i was with he's a good friend of mine he was my roommate but he's like super political and so he like runs up to the the abortion bus and he's like arguing politics with this guy like randomly in the street and i'm like i don't got time for this it's really cool <laughs> and, and so anyway he like tries to run up and jump in the abortion van to argue politics with this weird guy he doesn't know and i had to like go up in there and like he's a small guy so i literally had to pick him up and walk him back out and this scene that just always like brings me back to that moment where there's just this weird political <laughs> conversation and people in a truck that they don't belong in and you got to get them out and you know it's heartwarming to me <laughs> And um, I was so nervous for a second when you were telling this story that this was like a school trip, like your like junior high school trip to Washington, <laughs> D.C. But no, no, I was like 23 at the time. I was like, whoa. <laughs> I was like, they just left kids in D.C.? This is wild. What kind of school did you go to, sir? <laughs> school of hard knocks, apparently. Who's, uh, who's going to pick up this mess? Well, you're going to pick it up because you're a garbage man. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I think my the other favorite scene is when they go over to the Clopex and Hans is offering them snacks. Oh, and he yeah. offers them pretzels and sardines. Yes. And I just... <laughs> and when Hanks has to eat the pretzel and sardine, to me that is one of the most <laughs> awkward things where you're just like, you have to do it socially, but you really don't want to. And I just love the 
the awkwardness of that scene. It feels like my entire adult life mm -hmm. just being caught in this weird, awkward <laughs> social dynamic, trying to navigate my way through while other people <laughs> stare at me. You know, it's like my entire existence <laughs> summed up in, in one scene, but with sardines, you know? <laughs> oh, sardines. Well, then, yeah, yeah. For no, like the yeah. gross out Dude, effect, like, too, the, the, the sounds <laughs> of the sardines and the like sounds. chewing on the make are fantastic. And not only this, those sounds and like him like digging out the sardine, but like throughout the one thing that I did enjoy that they did throughout this movie is like the little like music notes like the little sound effects that would go along with like every little thing that would happen and just being so extra and so on top <laughs> with like everything like when he comes out in the car and puts the the garbage bag in in the trash can and then he's like hitting it and it's just like it's squishing and it's making like the most absurd noises <laughs> well the, the score it's for wild. this is great because the music is so daunting it is and good. so foreboding. And I think it's Jerry Goldsmith. Check my math on that, Lomas. Am I right? I honestly don't know who did the score, to be honest okay. with you. I'm, I'm like 90% positive it's Jerry Goldsmith uh, who did the score on this one. But the music is so great. Like, it just sets the tone from the get-go. Um, and then, yeah, the, like, yeah. scary, like... Because again, half of their like scary moments aren't really scary; they're explainable. Uh, but as they're like trying to compile mm -hmm. evidence against the Clopex, like sometimes their evidence is just nothing. But then I don't know. Right. They were in the backyard digging, and the <laughs> when the dog yeah. comes back with a bone oh. and hands it to Hanks, and he just throws so it. The best part about <laughs> that bone is. Uh, my dear friend, uh, brother Lomas down here last year sent me a gift and it was a t-shirt of a femur and it just said, this is Walter. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best. Who just happened to go to the hospital because he was <laughs> having chest pains. Right. That <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say they do a pretty decent job though of like getting you to just think that like Tom Hanks has been driven insane thinking that his neighbors are part of a cult because of his other neighbors and everything. And like, it's all good. And then all of a sudden when he's in the ambulance and the, 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 <laughs> the one old man pops up with the, with the syringe, like he's going to, yeah. he's going to kill him saying, you know, the, the people that are, there. it was such a good, I, was, I even, I went, Oh, that's a twist. I was like, I didn't I see that one coming. I figured that's how we were. The ending. first time I saw the movie, like the very first time I saw the Burbs, I remember feeling the exact same way. Like I grew up on like all of the heartwarming Tom Hanks movies. And I was like, he's going to have a heartwarming moment with this guy and they're going to bond. Nope. It's he's a serial killer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the evidence when they open the trunk and it's just a bunch of skulls. <laughs> like femur bones just sitting in the trunk oh it was, my god and it was like it makes you realize that there were so many missed opportunities though in like other hanks movies like if it if at the end of big they had just arrested that lady because she was hooking up with a 12 year old and she died in prison and that was the way that big ended we're totally different film completely different film <laughs> Damn, went deeper there, huh, yeah. Lomas? <laughs> <laughs> went Real for deep. big, did you? Got it. <laughs> where, where are Corey Feldman's parents? I, I kept trying to figure out, like, is he living there on his own? Is he a teenager in this movie? Because, like, he's drinking a beer with art. But then, like, he mentions how his parents are out of town. But, like, how old is Corey Feldman supposed to be I in this movie? <laughs> Because that was the other thing. I'm that thinking me. he's like 16. I always assumed he was around 16. Yeah, I always assumed he was in high school, 16 to 18 years old. Uh, but yeah, he stayed behind while his parents went on vacation to paint the house. And there's very little painting that's actually done by, uh, by Ricky there's Butler. There's no painting that's going on. And I feel bad he got paint all <laughs> over his pizza. speakers, too. That paint's never coming off of those speakers, man. That paint is never coming off of the speakers. Nope. No, they are not. 
I love, though, that he, like, treats it like a show with his neighbors. Like, he calls his friends over. Like, he has his girlfriend over. And, he, and she's like, why are we sitting out here? Why can't we go to the movies? She's like, oh, it's a movie, all right. <laughs> Let's just sit back and, and watch how it goes. Um, so Joe Dante directed this movie. I didn't realize how many movies I've seen and loved by Joe Dante, including Gremlins and Small yeah. Soldiers. Like, Small Soldiers, I feel like, is the burbs with toys that with mixed with toy story <laughs> i need to uh, i need to go back and rewatch small soldiers it's been it's been a minute that's for sure oh it's so good i loved oh it's uh, it's gets that whole like i remember the first time i i watched small soldiers and i was like oh my god this is not at all the comedy and family film i thought this was going to be <laughs> You know, it's not. It's a throwaway line in Small Soldiers, but I think my favorite line is Small Soldiers is where Dennis Leary says, let's put like a lifetime son of another battery in it and show those sons of bitches at Duracell. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really know why I love that line, but I've always loved that little line. Maybe it's somewhere I hate Duracell. It's so good. Maybe. Maybe. Um, but also he did Gremlins, and Gremlins is absolutely fantastic it's one of my favorite christmas movies of all time of all what time. are your feelings on gremlins 2 so, yeah we had this conversation last week i've i feel like i'm not at liberty to kind of say because i've only seen it once and it was a mm -hmm. really long time ago so i'm not i'm not quite sure where i stand on gremlins 2 but i will rewatch it and i can let you guys know but I am more than happy to hear this debate on Gremlins 2 and how people feel about it. I think Gremlins 1 is a far superior movie, but I think Gremlins 2 is a much smarter movie than Gremlins 1. Okay. Uh, I, think I got in trouble last weekend for not knowing enough about <laughs> Gremlins 2 uh, that I don't think I can make a conversation about that. I haven't seen Gremlins or Gremlins 2 in probably oh. 25 years, so... Uh, last weekend we were, a group of us were kind of all hanging out and having dinner and, you know, of course we're in the schmo down. So everybody's throwing trivia questions at everybody. You guys are monsters. I got a gremlins two like, question. Let's... I got a gremlins two question and I was like, I don't know. And then I just got chastised for not knowing the gremlins. <laughs> How <laughs> dare you not know gremlins two, sir. Um, <laughs> yeah, and then with watching this movie and doing kind of my research, of like what else came out in 1989. And I'm wondering if maybe that also could have played into why people weren't as receptive to the burbs. Cause you had back to the future Two came out that same year weekend at Bernie's sure. like another great dark 1989 was stacked for comedies. <laughs> like stacked. You had major league. I mean, who doesn't love major league? Come on. Uh, that's Communist <laughs> and other <Beather> workers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The people in uh, Tom Hanks is uh, crazy nightmare yeah. dream. Yeah, where does Art just have a book on satanic cults? Like he just had it, like just shows up with it. Like it's something he keeps every day. Okay, uh, I, I think every neighborhood has an Art Wine Gardener. <laughs> Absolutely, I like mine lives across the street from me. Um, only it's a female version of Art Wine Gardener. <laughs> She is the instigator and she is the like conspiracy theorist. And uh, I just think that art is that person. I, like Tom Hanks, his character is off of work right. for the week. Art's just always around. <laughs> like you never even really learned that. Like does art even have a job or does like, he just kind of patrol the neighborhood looking for conspiracies or looking, you know, coming up with these crazy wild outlandish theories. And again, this is my neighbor across the street it is fully that way. It does like, I worked from home today. I walked outside twice to take Darby to do his business. Both times she was just sitting there. And then the second time she's like, just almost like standing in the middle of the street, looking up and down the street. It's like, See, what's going on? <laughs> what is happening right now? Like, what are you looking for? The scenery hasn't changed. Nothing has morning. happened, lady. I also love, how again Carrie Fisher in this movie and whenever Art's around how she just does not want to deal with his shit 
Like, she just, like, looks so annoyed and so fed up by Art. Like, every single time he shows up, like, when, like again, that, that breakfast scene, when he starts grabbing food, like, she's rolling her eyes. Like, she looks so angry that he's even in their home. And it's because, like, he, like, we didn't even, like, the way we meet Art is he shows up because he's trying to shoot a crow. Like, he right. just has a gun in the backyard. Well, again, the physical comedy of Tom Hanks, like, Art shoots and takes out the light next to him. He's, like, checking his head for a bullet wound. <laughs> Art's got a gun! So great. The way he just, like, takes off with it. Oh, my God. I was, yeah. <clears throat> no, it, Art is, Art's a wild. And then I also love how, like, his whole entire house is on fire, but he's upset because his wife's home. <laughs> <laughs> that he's lost his right. house. Like, Art, your house is on fire and your wife's home. <gasps> my wife's home? Oh, my God. And another part about, like, the jokes being hidden, if you notice when Art is shooting the crow, he's got, like, an entire shrub that he's carrying around to hide yeah. himself. Yeah. <laughs> like, he's just going to blend into the surroundings of the community carrying a shrub and <laughs> with a gun. The... And, and shooting the most crows. like underappreciated art moment though is when he and Tom Hanks are like physically fighting one another, and Tom Hanks has the splint on his pinky because his pinky is uh -huh. broken, and Art's biting it <laughs> as they're fighting. And then afterwards, that they're like, Art's like kind of coming over to like make up to him. He's like, "Oh, you know, how's the finger? <laughs> how's, how's your hand?" <laughs> art Mike Gardner is definitely one of the best characters in this movie. That's for damn sure. I always, I yeah, I always thought that Rick Dukeman was going to become like the next sort of Jim Belushi, Chris Farley, like the party animal character guy. Yeah, and I don't really, I know he's passed away now, but I don't know what really happened to him because I always thought he was going to become the next sort of guy to fill that role in Hollywood. And then after the Burbs, he did like one or two more movies, and then he just kind of vanished. I have no idea what happened with him. Die? Any of you guys know? I think I can name one other movie that I can remember him in. It's Groundhog Day. Uh, he, he did Groundhog Day. He also was um, uh, Anna Ferris's dad in Scary Movie, <laughs> it looks like. Okay. And I think that was like the last big movie that he did. It, uh, he did. Uh, he well, he was like an extra, basically, in, in the um, Bow Wow, cla the little Bow Wow classic, like Mike. Oh, man. Mm. <laughs> he was a uh, his his credit for for that movie was a uh, dad outside arena. <laughs> <laughs> I remember my brother went and saw Rick Dukam and do stand up, uh, and I asked him how it was, oh. and he was like, it was awful. Uh, <laughs> And he's oh, like, it's no. not that like, he's like, it wasn't like that he was offensive. He's like, he just wasn't funny. Uh, <laughs> and he was like the undercard for, you know, one of these other guys who had, you know, had one or two movie roles. Uh, I, what? Uh -huh. Oh, his under, he was the undercard for the dad from uh, Friday. Pops. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, boy, that's, what that's a, a comedy show right set? there. <laughs> What a show. He actually did a lot more. He so he was also in Little Monsters right after that's the That's the only other like like after he did that movie, that's why I thought he was going to be the big guy cuz those movies were not too far apart and whether or not they did good yeah. at the box office like to me when I was younger, those were both like huge movies cuz I watched them so often. Mm -hmm. And then of course he was in Gremlins 2. Oh, I just recently, oh, he was in The Last Boy Scout. That's a great movie. I just watched that for the first time recently with uh, one of the, no, who is it? Damon, Damon uh, Wayans. Uh, Damon Wayans and Bruce Willis. Great movie. Fantastic. And then he was um, in Encino Man. God, he did a lot. He, But it looks like he did a lot of bit roles. Like he had a bit role in Last Action Hero, which I also just recently watched for the first time. That's an underrated movie. Like a couple months ago. Mm. That movie's mm -hmm. fantastic. The only issue that I that I've been having, and thank God I didn't have it with the mm -hmm. burbs, but with watching these first time movies that my husband has also seen and loves, like he loves Last Action Hero, loves all these movies. He does this thing where he will say a line that's upcoming as I'm watching something, but hasn't been said okay. yet. But he'll say the line and I'll turn around and I'll just go, What? Because I think he's talking to me. 
and then the line happens in the movie and I'm like, you need to stop. <laughs> <laughs> Like, well, I don't know what's going to then He'll go, watch the movie. And I'm like, stop fucking talking and I'll watch the movie. Uh, unfortunately, that's the way I am when we watch uh, Ghostbusters. Any iteration of Ghostbusters <laughs> in my house. Uh, I'm saying the line three lines before that line comes out. <laughs> yeah, that's literally like Frank was cooking dinner as I was watching Last Action here. And he was just throwing lines out there. And I go, huh? And he's like, turn around and watch. You won't miss it. I go, or just don't say it. We could we could try that <laughs> for for once maybe. The other thing that amazes me about my husband again with these first time watches is one day I was wa- back when like the pandemic first hit and we we're all quarantined not doing anything. I started watching movies that I had never seen because I either thought they were too long or just didn't know anything about. So he had actually gone to the store and I had thrown on um, First Blood and I was getting ready to watch it. It literally had just started so you haven't even seen sylvester stallone's face or anything about it he's like off in the distance walking down a hill and frank comes in no title cards no nothing he just looks at it for two seconds and goes why are you watching first blood i'm like how many times have you seen this movie that you know that off of like this first (laughs) two minutes of not seeing anything so that was fun i'm like make first time watches so fun but what do you know? I don't. He did the same thing with with uh, Big Little Trouble and everything. Every every goddamn movie, every time. If you want to treat yourself, if you can find like one of the early DVD releases of First Blood, Sylvester Stallone does like a you know a commentary track over the whole thing. Yeah, no. and it, it's very fascinating. Like literally thirty five minutes of him is just about him bitching about one extra in the movie because he hates the way the guy looks. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I don't know if you remember in First Blood, there are like these two soldiers that get like a copy of Soldier of Fortune magazine and they're yeah, talking think, yeah, about yeah. it. He yeah. literally just bitches about those two guys' faces for like 35 minutes and how they screwed up the movie. <laughs> Thanks for the cinematic insight there, Sly. <laughs> I love I love stories like this, like behind the scenes. So like one of my favorite like behind the scene movie stories, I think, is in The Godfather with Marlon Brando in that opening scene. He's sitting there and he has a cat and he's just petting this cat that just showed up on set. Like it wasn't even meant to be in the movie. It was just on set and he picked it up and was just was petting. He's like, Yeah, I'm gonna pet this cat. But the problem was the cat kept purring so loud that it was getting on the mics and like getting like you couldn't hear anything, but he refused to not hold and pet that cat. So they actually had to go back in and do a whole bunch of ADR <laughs> in that whole scene where like with like on his, at the, that whole opening scene because he refused to put the cat down and not pet it. <laughs> like I just to be like someone like Marlon Brando, not give a fuck and just sit there <laughs> and hold this cat when like you're direct, like Francis Ford Coppola is standing there going, can you put it down please? Please, please like, come on, to, come on Marlon. <laughs> to be a fly on the wall in that, uh, in that conversation. By the way, I looked it up. It was Jerry Goldsmith that did oh. uh, the the Five music. Pointer. Five pointer right there. You just gave it away. Just giving it away. All right, what's your uh, oh, brother man. Lomas? What's your thought on the like actual like Klopek family, like the actors who played the Klopeks? It's kind of weird. I think they're like the the youngest Klopek and Ruben they go together like perfectly and then the third clopec like the the leader clopec he he almost doesn't fit with them but in a weird way it's like if if you were like a serial killer and you were going to haul two people around the country you would probably want like these slow-witted awkward people you know (laughs) you know that weren't going to drag people into your life so in a weird way, I think if you were going to have a serial killer family, that's a lot what it would be like. Like if you ever watch those serial killer documentaries, a lot of them, that's what they're like. You have the serial killer who's really charismatic and outgoing and then his family that's sort of shut in and really quiet. So I actually think they did a good job of nailing it. Yeah. <laughs> of making the killer in the neighborhood. Dr. Warner, Warner Klopek, a uh, world-renowned pathologist i think is what yeah. he said 
<laughs> well, his his brother, uh, Uncle Ruben, Rubes, uh, Rubes. Like the whole scene that they're in the Klopex house is just sitting and staring like at Tom Hanks the entire scene. It's so great. <laughs> Why did did that? Speaking of like all of this stuff, when they go in the house and then they come out and they go back to Tom Hanks's house and he, you know, placates his wife and they go, why did he, when he was hiding the thing in the 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 toupee in his shorts, what was the point of going up through the leg <laughs> to pull it out? For, like, I feel, like that was a choice. I think it was nineteen eighty nine, <laughs> and that's still when. Uh... When short shorts were a thing for men, so I, I think there was just easier access to do it that way uh, than going in the, the standard, you know, belt loop down. Uh, I mean, look at like look at Vacation, right? National Lampoon's Vacation. Chevy Shorts has got the Great shortest movie. damn shorts like you've ever seen. It's like it's funny because those like phased out because I'm a child of the '80s uh, and uh-huh. like. I had short shorts and then those phased out come nineties and, you know, two thousands. But I definitely think like the shorts were of the time and it just, I think comedically made more sense for him to go in that way too. And they were like, Whoa, Whoa, Whoa. Oh, that was great. That was the, the whole who, but also who was digging in the back? Was Doc was Doctor Klopek one of the people in the backyard with the the other two? But like there there was like three people digging in that backyard in the rain. Yeah, it was I... the whole family. Yeah, for sure, it was the Klopek. Okay. Oh, what a wild family! And everyone has a weird neighbor, and that like ours are right next door too. We've never seen like I don't half the time we've been in our house now for three years, and I think I've seen the neighbors next door twice. Like they've come out <laughs> to like let the trash out, but like I don't know who they like, do. They I don't even know. They could be serial killers that live next door to me. I have no idea. Well, they could. I mean, maybe you're maybe you're equally as awkward to them. I wouldn't surprise That's me. Big. I'm really I, awkward. I made a whole bunch of friends on the internet in my mid thirties, <laughs> yeah. so clearly I'm. <laughs> I might be the cool pet. <laughs> my, my life choices. <laughs> My wife certainly is. Like, my <laughs> wife waves to everybody and smiles to everybody. I just do my thing. I never talk to my neighbors. <laughs> That's why I love you, Moose. You, you see, I will, I will fly to California and hang out with Moose before I will talk to my neighbors. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's that's not an exaggeration because I'm a weird guy and Moose is a weird guy. And that's the way that yep. it should be. Amen. So how the absolutely, and that is why all of us get along so well. Clearly, mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so how we bring this together. It's not lost on me, also, that I've had to do a I I I, I I've had to put together and do a presentation for a conference that I'm going to. Um, that I'll have already gone to by the time <laughs> <laughs> this comes out. But I'm gonna be talking to a bunch of young adults with Down mm-hmm. syndrome about safety on the internet (laughs) (laughs) and like using social media to connect with family and friends, but also like being safe and not meeting strangers (laughs) on the internet. And it's literally been the last year and a half of my life. It's fine. (laughs) Do as I say, not as I do. (laughs) As I sit here. What are you gonna do? It is. It's. It's. It's fine. Everything's fine. Um, but I feel like we haven't given enough love to Bruce no. Dern in this in this movie. And the I, I I will say it's so smart how very stereotypical they did the neighbors. Like you have the one neighbor that's always in your shit that's nosy about everything, and then you have the one that is like <laughs> the spy and the the vet and. All those with the smoking hot wife that you have no idea how he landed, but clearly <laughs> figured it out. And then the one old guy who just lets his dog shit on everybody's yard. Like, it's it's perfection in that sense, I feel like. I respect that Bruce Dern has an automatic flag raiser. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really know why, but that's... It's the most un-American thing, and he's using it for the most American reason, and I can't really explain it. 
Rumsfeld is that Rumsfeld is, is the yeah. like the hidden gem of this movie. Like Bruce Ternstein, like when he both of his feet go through the porch of the Clopex, <laughs> and but he's pissed because he dropped the brownies. <laughs> Not that he went through yeah. the floor. He's like, God, drop the goddamn brownies. <laughs> Not the goddamn but then he hands him the horn also... covered in leaves. He's like, there you go, sunny little son for the sweet tooth. <laughs> <laughs> and then when uh when uh uh with the bees when they knock on the door and then the bees come out and he's standing there with the hose, just like over here, get the water, get the water. Like he's not like helping them, like running to them to help, but he's like calling people over, he's just spraying well, Tom. He tries, he tries to, and then the hose reaches its head and throws him yeah. up. In the air. <laughs> Like just spraying them with a hose, like that's gonna do there's anything. There's like a there's like a little subtle joke that Bruce Dern plays perfectly when Tom Hanks when uh, Art is climbing up the electric pole uh, to clip the mm -hmm. electricity to the Clopex like alarm system. And Tom Hanks, his character, asks him. He goes, "Why the hell didn't you go up there?" And he looks up and he goes, "Oh, it's awfully high." And you're kind of not expecting that from this guy in like a military garb. He's got a rifle on his shoulder. <laughs> it's, uh, Dern kills it in this role. It's, Bruce Dern absolutely kills yeah. it as Rumsfeld. Oh, he's fantastic. Oh, he's so good. And he's also like this, he's also like a commentary on like red state America. You know, he's, he's always got the guns. He's always got the military guard, but he's also always the furthest away from the action. He's talking yeah. the loudest, yeah. but he's also <laughs> always making sure that everybody else is walking into danger while he sits across the street staring. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's, Nailed oh, it, that's so perfect. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so kind of with all that, I need to hear from you, Lomas, why The Burbs itself as a whole is the greatest movie of all time. There, there are like three criteria I use for like evaluating a movie. One is rewatchability. And even to this day, like there, there is not a year that goes by that I don't rewatch The Burbs. But every time I rewatch it, I find something new to laugh about. And, you know, this has been going on for... 20 something years, you know, plus, and there's always something new to laugh about. So that's criteria. Number one, criteria. Number two is none of the characters grow or develop during the movie. That's why like Seinfeld is the greatest TV show at the end. No one has grown. No one has learned anything. No one has become better people. <laughs> that is the second criteria for a great show. And third, there's a definitive ending. Like at the end of it, there's not like a, like if you look at like the Oscar movies from a couple years ago, you know, you had like Nomadland, uh, The Sound of Metal, like every single one of those movies ends with someone sitting alone, staring forlorn into the distance with, and there's no definitive ending. But with the Burbs, everybody dies and, you know, watch it, the dude's wife comes home and he's miserable. Every single character gets a definitive ending and you know what happens. And it meets all three criteria that you need for a perfect film. Yeah. Okay. They definitely don't grow. You're, you're not wrong about that. You can clearly see at the end of the movie that they're all just going to go back to doing exactly what they were doing before. And that's the sign of a like, great character. They were written so well, they don't have to change. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I can see that. Well, it's almost evident <laughs> in like when the police is debunking everything that Art is telling him. And the detective uh -huh. is like, and he's like, you don't actually believe this guy's a doctor. He's like, yes, I do. He's a world-renowned pathologist. And he's like, well, what about the bone? What about the bone? He's like, there's bones all over. Like everything he's throwing at him, like yeah. they, they just keep de like debunking Art, but Art just keeps at it to the point where he's like at the end giving an interview. And he's just like, you know, suburbanites, we're not going to take it. We're coming after you. We're not going to. And again, to Lois's point, like, there's no character development. Like, if they were completely wrong, Art would still hold that these guys were actual serial killers. Yeah. Like, they could have been the, like, yeah. sweetest, like, people that they were made out to be before they turned out to be the actual serial killers. And Art still would have stuck to that their ground. So, I agree, brother. Lois. Yeah. That's, no, uh, yeah. There is no character development for them. 
Not, not in this suburb. <laughs> and I wonder too if, so the way that the house burns down because of the gas and everything, the people who had when the Clopex, the story was that where they moved from their house had burned down. So I'm wondering if where they moved from was another suburban area. And then if like the same, like if he's insinuating that the same thing happened before they moved to that house. Oh, interesting. Except the, uh, the suburbanites there didn't catch him. Yeah. And then maybe his, he's got a giant furnace and also not to like be nitpicky. But if you have a giant furnace in your basement that's burning bodies, that's gonna smell. Like, I get, but, you know, then, of course, we don't have a movie with them, like, you know, <laughs> searching for things. But, like, in my head, I'm like, I feel like someone would have, should have called well, they, before. They pointed that out. Like, in the scene when uh, Hans drives out the bag of, of garbage and beats it, like, the... The uh, uh, furnace is flaring in the basement, and Rumsfeld, Rumsfeld even comments. He says, it smells like they're cooking a damn cat over there. Uh, oh, so there right. is kind of that okay. like little hint to it. But again, like they're suspicious, but don't don't bring in anyone else into their little like clique of people who are going to do something about this. So uh, absolutely, that was probably on everyone's radar. But hell, this is a neighborhood that's just going to allow like a big plot of uh, garbage to sit in the middle of the street for the entirety of, you know, the film. So the rest of the, which this whole movie itself, it's very, and they do a very good job of having it like literally only take place over a span of like three days. Like they go to bed, they wake up the next day. They, there's not like, there's no other like insane long passage of time. It's like, this is happening in like the first part of his weekend of his vacation. And like, that's how it starts. So it makes it a great movie, right? There's no room for interpretation. Yeah, it's very literal. That's for, I mean, I watching it, I'm like, because even I like watching it, I was sitting there wondering, like, when is the shoe going to drop? Like, w- like the neighbors are just weird. Like, that's where we're going with it. And then it all culminates right there at the end. And you go, oh, oh, they really were. Like, you think they, they, they do a really, he did a, Joe Dante with the, with the did a, they did a really good job of just making you be like, it's just a weird neighbor. Like, everyone has a weird neighbor, and that's all it is. They're just weird neighbors until he shows up with the green syringe of, of fluid <laughs> to kill. <Tom> Hanks. <laughs> Which he didn't need to do. Like, again, so unnecessary because, like, he was going to get all this money and could have sued them and done all this stuff. He didn't need to kill Tom right. Hanks. <laughs> it was a little unnecessary. <laughs> I don't know. I like think part of what makes the the ending of the movie so magical is it, is it's so jarring. There's really no there's no foreshadowing. Like the whole movie, you're meant to feel sorry for these people, and then it turns out, you know, it it's really like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. If you happen to be like Leatherface, was really likable and normal. <laughs> And he moves into your neighborhood instead of going to his house. Like he's, <laughs> he comes in. It's quite a family that, that they have there for and sure. And Dr. Klopek, um, like he could have left things be. He could have let Tom Hanks and Art and Rumsfeld all go to jail and could have gotten away with everything, except he has to go in for the kill. Uh, right. So it, it it is a perfect ending because Okay, this family really was a serial killer. They're going to show you what a, a real serial killer would do in this particular circumstance. And, is they would still go for... How did he even... I want to know is how he got into the ambulance. I was not... Like, where did he come from? Like, he just popped up. I'm pretty convinced in, like, the 80s, ambulances had trap doors in the bottom so you could just sneak <laughs> in. Or sneak out. I can name, yeah, I, I mean... A lot of drug overdoses in the 80s. People could have just popped up from a cocaine bender and been like, dude, I need to get out of here. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, I can name, like, multiple 1980s movies where people just, thunk, appeared in the midst of an ambulance. <laughs> like, it, it happened in uh, Monster Squad, uh, The Verbs, you know. I, I, I can oh keep going. Oh, my God. Monster Squad. <laughs> Monster Squad is another insane 80s movie 
when Dracula calls the one little girl a little bitch. <laughs> it's the most. <laughs> You're just like, what are you doing? <laughs> in this movie. It's a wild, a wild movie. If you haven't seen it or if it's been a while, you need to go back and watch it because Monster Squad is probably the greatest Halloween movie of all time next to Hocus Pocus. And I appreciate in Monster Squad, there is literally an hour long build up to kicking a werewolf in the nuts. They, they literally <laughs> dedicate an hour of screen time building to that moment. Wolfman's got nards! <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite movie lines of all time. <laughs> I think I send that gift to like I find I found like give it and I send it to my husband at least like I try to do it at least once a month. <laughs> Just to... well, you should. <laughs> why he married me? Because I come up with shit like that. Oh man. Well, I think at this rate, I think I'm ready to 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 rate uh the burbs on a out of out of five stars. Eight? Um, I'm not <laughs> definitely eight. <laughs> I think I might have my first disappointed <laughs> friends. I gotta go. I gotta go. I, I'm like two and a oh, half. For no, now. this is wrong. Mm. <laughs> this is very wrong. Mm. Yikes. I'm sorry. Oh, it's just, just bring I, us on to, to pull a wolf man <laughs> on us at the end, huh? <laughs> It was just, it was, I, maybe on, like, more watches, it might go up a little bit. Because, like you said, a lot of the, like, a lot of the straight-up humor was fun. But also, like, it was, it, if some of the pace, it's all, like, Tom Hanks is going from, like, he's, he doesn't believe, and then he's, it just, it was a little, it was a lot. There was a lot happening. Like, I kept worrying about Corey Feldman and where his parents were. <laughs> Like, I, where? How did he get into the the ambulance? How did people like I? Uh, those are those are the things I think of. It's what I'm also the person who when <laughs> when I watched the made for TV movie classic Sharknado with my little sister at the very end of the movie um, when Ion Zaring gets eaten by the shark real quick, he cuts himself out of the shark right like. Almost like 30 seconds later. It's one of those, you know, things. He cuts himself out because he had a chainsaw. And earlier on in the movie, the babysitter that he thought was hot was also eaten by a shark. And apparently it was eat it was the same one that, that ate, tried to eat him. So when he cut himself out of the shark, he was standing there holding her. And she was alive. And I looked at my little sister and I go, that would never happen. She goes, 90 minutes into a movie about sharks and tornadoes. And that's that's where you have an issue. <laughs> Like <laughs> that's weird. So, so are you saying that shark would have digested them faster than that? No, I'm saying that. Well, the one woman would not still be alive at that point if, like, she was eaten thirty minutes earlier. Well, if if the shark chewed, I agree with. <laughs> but but I'm saying if they're all in one place, clearly this shark did not chew. So I don't know how fast a, char a shark digests. Do you know, Moose? Okay. Well, I think I'm gonna. I think we're gonna open up a brief debate. I need to hear both sides of this argument here over whether or not we believe that the shark who swallowed a woman 30 minutes before Ion Zering was swallowed. Keep in mind, this shark also existed in a tornado, uh, and devoured them in one bite. So had it be a large shark, I think we can both enter that into both of the argument's sake, right? It's a rather large shark. It was a yeah. two full-size sure. people. Uh, and then while you guys are giving me your arguments, I'm going to look up uh, how quickly the digestive tract of a shark is. <laughs> so let's start with Lomas. Go. Okay. Your, your reasoning why this could happen. Because it sounds okay. like you believe that this could happen. So... My theory is if you have a flying tornado shark, right, it doesn't have the, the normal chemical makeup of your regular underwater shark. So it, it, it may need to digest 
slower, you know. It's happened to burn less calories than the standard shark. Like a standard shark, it's always swimming. It's got to be perpetually burning calories. But a tornado shark, the tornado's doing all the work. So you got to think that this shark is burning like one three thousandth of the underwater shark's calories. So it may not digest its food really quick. And if it like eats things, you know, like let's say like it's a boa constrictor kind of deal where the teeth are all about show, you know, like the teeth are just like a, a cocky move on the shark's part. You know, they're not functional. Then they could just be hanging down around in there for hours. So like if he got there, I think it's theoretically that she could be there. You know, the shark's got gills, so a lot of oxygen's pumping in there. It's all about how much stomach acid is down there. That's that's the question. Okay. Good argument. Allison, your argument why this why a shark in a tornado swallowing two, not one, but two full size human beings is a possibility or is not a possibility. Go. Well, swallowing the human beings is one hundred percent a possibility. But an Ian Zaring getting out of it right away, I get. But when you swallow someone, I would think that it, with your, regardless of how long it takes to digest, you're still going through the motions. So you're in the stomach. You're not exactly near the lungs. So you're not getting that much oxygen. And the stomach juices are already churning and going because chances are this shark has already eaten a lot of other people. So it could just be churning away. And as soon as those the acid starts going and starts eroding, it's, I mean, I don't think it's like as slow as a, as like a Sarlacc pit where like you're getting digested for thousands of years. But I would think within 30 to 40 minutes, you would at least stop breathing at that point. Because I don't know how much oxygen can get into a stomach. I was not prepared for Brother Lomas to have such a good argument that I now believe him could be correct. <laughs> I mean, a tornado is essentially a, one, a wind tunnel of air, right? So it yeah. could be fresh air coming into the shark's gills. No. A tornado isn't 100% made out of water, right? It's got to have that air quality in there. Okay. So per Google, it says that they found that sharks begin voiding undigested matter up to 68 hours later. Uh, and that the digestive tract will take up to 16 to 17 hours to start Done. breaking down. It's, so then, never mind. That's Sorry, plausible. 100% plausible. <laughs> and this has been sitting on my mind for like 10 years. That's right. <laughs> now the survival <laughs> probability and therefore another human being existing and then me being swallowed by a shark whilst yeah. also having yeah, yeah. a uh, chainsaw in my hand. That makes it a little less plausible. I'm going to have to declare this a <laughs> not uh, substantiated answer. <laughs> uh, yep. No, no. I think we're coming close to like documentary <laughs> accuracy at this point. Like, I think that's how folks are. Uh, uh, so I do have a friend of mine that was actually, uh, he's the guy who kind of got me into trivia. He has his own trivia show and he used to do bar trivia out here in California. He has a podcast trivia with buds. Um, he was in Sharknado, and oftentimes, if you win his trivia night, That's he fantastic. gives you an autographed photo of him in Sharknado. He's the guy who's on the beach missing a leg, and he's screaming. So, like, the picture of him that he gives you an autograph of is, like, just, That's like, amazing. him screaming on the beach My, and bloody uh... stuff. <laughs> so, I think we also have to factor in that if the sharks are taking limbs... Like, Probably the stomach also. What if you get kicked limbs? in the face and then knocked out while you're mm. inside that shark? This is gonna be. This is an episode for. <laughs> there's so many. <laughs> but it's so funny talking like missing limbs, yeah, and this will be like my variables. last little tangent. My brother went to school at um, University of West Georgia, with uh, and he was he was part of like the theater department there, and one of his. Well, so one of the guys that Lots he of people was, limbs. that was in the theater program there. Um, did not have either one of his legs and it the walking dead at the time it filmed in atlanta so they were always looking for extras and he was always a featured extra because they could put him as like a walker with no legs or doing something and 
crawling. So he was always like a oh. featured extra because they he could do the so much with him time. because he already didn't have legs. I'm going to hell for telling this story. <laughs> And you can always shoot for purgatory. I, I think that's a purgatory we'll offense, to, to be honest with you. <laughs> <When> we... <laughs> I mean, he is Brother Lovis. He, 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 he would know where um, you would fall. All that, that being said, life. this has been an absolute blast. Uh, Lomas, where can people find you? Um, well, there's a dumpster on 8th Street. <laughs> And I do like to sit behind that sometimes and contemplate. So, like, if it's a Tuesday, you can probably find me there. Um, I also have a Twitter account that says Brother Lomas. And I am on that because I'm famous on the internet now. <laughs> you absolutely are. And Moose, how about you, my friend? Uh, I'm on Twitter at Big Moose Haas. Uh, I wish I had a clever antidote quite like Brother Lomas does, but I, I don't. I'm there. Yeah. Also, really check out it. Moose's only fans page. A lot of really surprising content. A lot of surprising content. <laughs> Gotta keep it real, I guess. <laughs> He does, does. Live, he does live in Southern California. That shit ain't cheap. You got to do what you got to do. <laughs> I'm not judging. Not I'm at not all. Judging. You do what you got to do. It's all yeah. good. <laughs> And to everyone else, if you're enjoying what you are hearing, please subscribe, rate, and review on whatever audio platform you are listening to us on. If you're listening on YouTube, please make sure to comment, subscribe, like, and let me know your thoughts on the burbs. And be sure to hit that little bell for notifications anytime we have new content drop. Leave me suggestions as well of what films you would like to see covered on You've Never Seen It. You can follow the show on Twitter at Never Seen It FNR, and you can follow me on Twitter at Allison Salamone. And until next time, my friends, be safe. And let's go watch some movies.